afternoon. We've got part two of a presentation on the inner workings of Elite on the BBC Micro. Mark previously gave a presentation largely focused on the cassette version. And today he's going to take us through his findings on the disk and 6502 second processor. So over to you, Mark. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Yes. So uh, this is a part two. You don't have to have seen part one to follow along with this, but it probably would be useful. But um, essentially, this is part two of um, uh, what goes on inside Elite. Um, and uh, let me start my presentation because that will explain what I'm going to talk about. Um, there we go. Right. So I'm going to talk about the disk and 6502 second processor versions of Elite. Last time I covered the cassette version. And there's obviously quite a few differences. Uh, but first of all, let me give you a quick summary of, of how this all came about and, and what I'm talking about. Hang on a minute. There we go. Um, so uh, back in lockdown one, if you can remember that far ago, um, I uh, was looking for something to do and decided that annotating the source code of Elite would uh, keep me busy. And the original source is uh, available from Ian Bell's site, one of the co-authors of, of Elite. So I took that, added lots of uh, comments to it, um, wrote lots of deep dive articles on it, created a GitHub repository where you could build the source and um, put it all on a, a website, bbcelite.com, that contains the, the, the source automatically generated from the, the GitHub repository. So there's lots of information out there. Um, along comes lockdown two, just before Christmas, and that seemed like a good time to uh, grab the, the source for the 6502 second processor version of Elite, which is uh, also available for me in Bell's site. Um, and I broke it all up into uh, under under the bonnet into a whole library repository, which I can talk about later if people are interested, um, which enables me to generate multiple versions of the source. Um, and I've just finished and launched this week the disk version that comes from the same thing, um, a big library project containing all of the various sources all mashed together that produce these repositories. So the, the website is the best place to start if you're interested in diving into this. And this presentation is really a super quick run through of the things that I found that were interesting while looking through the disk and 6502 second processor versions. Um, the disk version, the source isn't available out there that I've managed to find. So I had to disassemble the disk version. But having got the cassette and 6502 second processor versions already, that was a relatively straightforward process. Um, but the coverage is the same. So. Let's quickly run through what the extra features of the, the disk and second processor versions are on top of the cassette version. Obviously, the cassette version is the base version um, and is the core game, but there are quite a few differences in the enhanced disk version and the kind of full color 6502 version. So the disk version, it's, um, it's probably the canonical version. It's the one that people will um, probably ref remember most fondly of all the versions on the BBC, I would have thought. Um, unless you're an Electron owner, in which case, of course, it was the Electron version. Um, but mainly because it had loads of additional chip types. There were 12 different designs in the cassette version, and there are 29 different designs uh, in the disc version, which is a considerably larger uh, number. They also come with a, a additional data called newbie in the uh, source, new byte, um, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, that gives uh, the AI uh, routines a lot more information to do rather more sophisticated things. So there is quite a different feel to the disk version. It feels a lot more immersive. Um, there's also the Dodo space station, the dodecahedral one that uh, appears in systems of tech level 10 and above. You've got mining and military lasers. Um, there's two missions uh, where one of them is to chase after a stolen ship, the constrictor, and the other one is to transport some data across the galaxy while being chased by Thargoids. Um, there's a proper docking computer, which I'll be talking about later, which grabs control of the, the ship and actually docks you in front of your eyes, hopefully in front of your eyes. Um, there's, uh, the original cassette version has a, a text token system for um, compressing all of the, uh, all the text, game text, and there's a whole separate extended text token and system description system in Disk Elite, which I will be talking about. You can also search for systems by name, which is handy when you're following a mission and need to know where to go. When you dock, there's a, a glimpse of the inside of the station is shown. And finally, there is support for bit stick joystick, which is a very fancy kind of CAD joystick 
that uh, Acorn sold. And the main difference is that you can twist the stick on that. And in Elite, that speeds you up and slows you down. I'm not sure how usable that is, but um, it's a feature anyway. So 6502 second processor, obviously running on the tube. I'll be talking a lot more about that and how it works uh, in this talk. Um, the main difference is it's, it's color. So you have a four color space view instead of just black and white and an eight color dashboard. And it uses modes one and two for those two rather than modes four and five because it has the extra memory in the second processor. Um, it's pretty garish. It's not something I'm a great fan of, but you know, this is the eighties and it kind of looks quite eighties really. So I guess it's quite apt. Um, it's also a lot faster, the second processor version. It makes it quite a lot harder to play um, because you don't get a nice handy slowdown when you've got lots of ships, which is quite a handy feature of the disk version. Um, that's because it's obviously running on a, a faster processor, the three megahertz um, 65C02, as opposed to two megahertz 6502 in the BBC. And it also has a, a sprinkle of parallelism, which I'm gonna talk about when I talk about how the tube version works. There's an extra ship. Uh, in the second processor version, the Cougar, which I'll, I'll uh, talk about a bit later. There's a, a Star Wars-like scroll text demo with text going up the screen, um, which I'll also mention. Um, and because of the extra memory, everything is loaded in memory at once. So all of the code and all of the ships are in, are in memory all at the same time. So there's no file loading, no disk access required during the game, which speeds things up again. Um, Another thing that makes it harder to play is you can have more ships in the local bubble. So you can have up to 12 ships in the original Elite, in the disc and cassette version. You can have up to 20 in the 6502 second processor version. And that's, that makes life pretty hectic, really, uh, especially as you can have up to seven cops in the area rather than just four in the other one. So if you um, fire at the station, you're going to die a lot more quickly. Um, so... Uh, there's, because of the way that, uh, that everything's loaded in memory as well, it does have different spawning rules um, because we don't need to check whether we have got the, the ship blueprints in memory. I'll come on to how that works in the disk version later on. Um, but it does mean you can see any ships at any time in the second processor version, which is not the case in the disk version. Um, finally, there's a couple of really uh, uh, interesting uh, retro features. One is that if you hold down control while pressing any of the F keys for to get the trading screens or the inventory screens, it's sent it to the printer if you have one attached. Um, and if you pause the game and press control D, it saves a screenshot of the game, which you can then view using a special loading program on the disc. So those are all the extra features. I'm not gonna run through all of those. I'm just gonna pluck out the more interesting ones. So uh, let's move on to the next one. I mentioned that the uh, ships in, in the disc version and in the 6502 version have an extra byte in their ship blueprints. And the ship blueprints are essentially the hard-coded, each type of ship has a hard-coded table with all the uh, different attributes for that ship. So essentially when we spawn a ship, we take the blueprint and, and you know, create the, the spawned ship from, from that data. Um, there's an extra flag um, and it has eight bits in it. And this enables us to uh, determine the type of ship this is, or the type of behavior of this ship rather. It's not, it's not so much a blueprint thing as a, it's more of the attitude of the person at the helm. So bit zero determines whether this ship is a trader. Traders fly between the planet and station. You have uh, half of them going one way, half of them going the other. That's when we're in the, in the station area. Outside of that, they're basically heading for the planet. So these are traders that are minding their own business um, and won't, won't attack you. Bit one determines whether it's a bounty hunter. Bounty hunters will attack us if we are a fugitive or a serious offender, which makes sense. They might attack us even if we're not, but that's uh, far less likely. Um, and bit two is set if someone is hostile, uh, in which case they will attack us irrespective of our status. Um, and obviously if we fire on a ship, they become hostile. Um, bit three determines whether someone is a pirate, which means that they will attack um, us on site, irrespective of whether we're good or bad. But if we enter the space station, safe zone, they stop attacking. So even pirates escape space station. Um, bit four is set if, a, if a, a, a ship is in the process of docking, which is often applied to trading ships plying their way between the, the, the space station and the planet. So if you sit around and watch, you can watch, um, you know, uh, watch ships com coming out of the, the Coriolis heading for the the planet and coming back again, those guys have got their docking um, bit set. 
Bit five, it, it means that they're an innocent bystander and killing one of these will instantly bring on the cops. These are generally uh, ships hanging around in the space station area, minding their own business. Uh, things like shuttles and transporters and stuff like that. Bit six is set if a uh, ship is a cop and those um, you kill one of those and you're an instant fugitive. It only applies to two blueprints here. The Viper, obviously the Viper is the, the cop's favourite ship. And then the Worm, for some reason the Worm, I don't know whether they're protecting the Worms or whether the Worms have got undercover cops in or whatever. But if you kill a Worm, instant fugitive. Um, the final flag is bit seven, which determines whether um, the ship has a, an escape pod. That's uh, uh, so if we if we are hammering a ship and then eventually just before they blow up, they have there is in the code the option for them to fire off an escape pod. It'll only happen if they have this bit set in their blueprint. Um, and in a spawned ship, um, it uh, determines whether a ship has been scooped or has docked, and that just makes sure it disappears from the, from the scanner. So this, this new flag that is only in the kind of more enhanced versions of Elite, it gives the tactics routine a lot more subtlety as to what's going on. And, you know, it, it, if you sit around, particularly in the 6502, the second processor version, which has a lot more ships and a lot more spawning going on, um, you can kind of see these behaviours in a way that just doesn't exist in the cassette version. So it's, it's quite a nice addition. Um, now, one of the big differences between the disc and the cassette versions is um, you've got a disc drive. And um, the way that it crams more functionality into the, into the game is by splitting up the code base into two large files, one for when you're docked and the other for when you're in flight. Of course, when you launch um, from uh, your space station, you get a lot of chunker chunker on the disc, and that's because it's swapping out the code um, into, the, into the, you know, the other one. And the same happens when you dock. So they're called t.code and d.code. T.code is for when you're docked. I think that probably stands for T for trading, maybe. And D.code is for when you're in flight. So it's actually a bit confusing. They feel like they're the wrong way around, but I'm not sure what the D stands for in D.code, but that's what they're called. Um, and they basically swap out almost all of the memory, um, the, all the code memory. Um, all of the variables are stored in places like zero page and various pages um, throughout. Those aren't overwritten, so the, the, the state of the game is retained and the code is just swapped in and out. It's actually from address 11E3 onwards. Um, so uh, that, that gets swapped out between the two. So that means that the disk version can um, fit in an awful lot more code, which is where the extra functionality comes from. You obviously could do the same with a cassette, but that would be a five minute wait every time you docked to reload. So that wasn't realistic. Um, so on launching, it loads the flight code, as I mentioned, but it also loads one of 16 ship blueprint files, which are on the disk. If you look at the disk version of the disk, it's full of these files called D, MOA, MOB, MOC, and so on up to MOP. These are ship blueprint files, and they contain um, a set of ship blueprints, ship designs. Now, there's not enough memory in the disk version to load all of the um, available ship designs in one go. So they've split them up into these 16 files, and they load the appropriate one. Um, there's a randomness to it. I'll, I'll explain what happens there. Um, essentially, it's, um, it sets a number between 0 and 15, and then loads the relevant file, and that number Bit zero of that number is a zero for low-tech um, systems, so uh, below 10, and it's a one for high-tech systems, above 10 and above. Um, so for example, that means that A and C and E and so on, every other one contain the Coriolis space station uh, blueprint, and then B, D, gosh, this is like countdown or something, uh, the other, other ones, contain the, the dodo uh, station blueprint. And so it always loads the correct one depending on the, the tech level. Similarly, bit one is set to zero for dangerous systems, which is anarchy, feudal and multi-government, and one for the safer systems. And so these uh, files are broken down into a kind of structure so the right ship blueprints get loaded for the right requirement. Uh, bits two to three are always randomly set, so there is a random element within those two uh, constraints. So each ship blueprint file is about two and a half K, well, it's exactly two and a half K actually, contains between 11 and 14 ships of the 32 that are possible. Every single one of them uh, contains the cargo canister and Viper blueprints, because those are essential parts of the game, and also the missile blueprint 
is permanently resident in memory above screen memory. There's a page above the end of screen memory that in the cassette version contains a Python blueprint, but in the disk version contains the missile blueprint. So that's always present. So those three are always present. Um, and then the others are a, a varying uh, rarity. The rarest ships, the Anaconda, the Transporter and the Moray, each of which only appear in one file. So each time that a, a ship, each time you dock, um, each time you launch rather, uh, there's a, you know, one in 16, it's probably less than one in 16 because they only appear in one and you'd have to be in the right tech level, but those are the rare ones. So seeing those it is quite rare. Um, so the, the way the disk um, code works is it, 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 um, has a, it has a table for all 32 ship addresses, but it has a zero in the ones that aren't loaded in the current file. So when spawning a pirate, for example, it knows that the pirates live in this range of ships and it works its way through skipping over the ones with zero until it finds one with an address that points to a valid blueprint. So they're grouped together. Um, and there's a, there's a couple of ones that the MOC and MOD are loaded when you're doing mission two and carrying the plans through space or when you go to which space, because that's when you need Thargoids. And those are the only two uh, files containing the Thargoid uh, blueprints. And MOG contains the constrictor, which is a mission ship um, that only so that will get loaded in Arara, uh, which is the mission one destination system. So that there, that there, there is a little bit of logic around if we're in this mission at this point, definitely load this one. But otherwise, it's random. Um, and uh, so that's how the disk system split its code up into smaller chunks that it loads. So another, another big change and one of the iconic ones in the disk elite is the docking computer. In Cassette Elite, if you press C and you have a docking computer and C activates it, you instantly dock, which is, makes it a lot easier to play the game because you can get on with things a lot more quickly. But it, it's a bit, it's slightly kind of, uh, anyway, this is more immersive in the disk version because it grabs control of your ship and steers it nail bitingly and hopefully into the space station or through the slot rather, not into the space station. Um, so how does it do that? Well, there's a whole bunch of rules around this, and I should point out that this is slightly work in progress, this one. So um, take this with a slight pinch of salt. But um, essentially, it runs through a bunch of rules when you press C. If we're far away, uh, i.e. outside of the space station safe zone or quite a long way from the space station, it just heads for the planet until we get close enough to apply the following logic. It then works out what angle we are approaching the space station at. And it does that by working out the, the angle between the direction between the vector between us and the center of the station and the, um, uh, the the vector pointing out of the slot of the station so how far off are we and basically if we're coming from behind the space station or up to 69 degrees off the optimal approach straight in through the slot so basically most of the way around the station then it heads for the optimal docking point which is eight unit vector lengths from the center of the station out through the slot. So it's directly in front of the slot, eight unit vectors, and at each station is the radius of the station is one vector length. So that's four space station widths in front of the slot. It decides to head for that. Now that sounds pretty sensible, but there is a bit of a, a problem with that. If you're behind the station and the slot's directly on the opposite side to you, it will drive straight through the station on the way to the optimal docking point and kill you. So you should never put your docking computer on if you're behind the station or things won't end well. Um, so when we get round to the front, um, it checks whether we're in, that, in this cone coming out of the slot. Um, and if we're pointing towards the station, then it refines our approach, which I'll describe in a second. And if we're not, it checks our distance. And if we're too close, turns away and, and gets away from the station. So if it, if it realizes that it's too close, it will abort and, and turn around. But assuming things are okay, and we're basically heading sort of towards the slot, uh, the refine our, uh, our approach system, it applies pitch and roll to get the station in our sights. And once the station's in our sights, it matches the station roll to try to get the slot horizontal. And once the roll is matched, it slams on the acceleration and dives into the slot. And it works most of the time, but not all of the time, which I guess is part of the thrill of the docking computer. So that's how the docking computer works. Um, another uh, uh, feature is that there's an awful lot more text in the disk version. Now, the, 
the game text in Elite is very compressed because memory is a real challenge in this game. Um, and the cassette version has a set of standard tokens um, printed by the Natalie named TT27 routine. And these break down to three different types. And I covered these in the last talk, so I'll briefly tell that there's characters, which are alphanumeric characters, control codes, which do things like print the current system name or the current command name and things like that. Two letter tokens that are used to put together system names. So LAVE is LA and VE, for example, and recursive tokens that enable us to build up tokens from other tokens from other tokens and so on. Now those all still exist in the disk elite uh, version. And there's an additional one uh, of extended tokens, which is printed by the DTOC routine that contains a whole raft of other texts, mainly around uh, missions and system descriptions and things like that. So there's obviously in that there are still alphanumeric characters. There's two letter tokens, but there's an extended uh, table of that. There's a whole bunch tacked on the front of the table at TKN2. And recursive tokens, it works in the same way, uh, but they have their own table, TKN1. There are two extra types which are quite interesting. There are jump tokens, there's uh, 32 of those, and these literally jump to an address in a table. And so you can do anything with one of these. It's, it, you know, literally, it's just literally jumping into the assembler. So they've got jump tokens that will clear the screen or just clear the bottom of the screen, show the incoming message screen, which flashes incoming message and waits for a while and then clears. Um, it'll display a ship rotating while waiting for a key press, which happens at the start of mission one. It'll justify text. So that happens with the system descriptions, for example, or it will print the, the captain name from the relevant mission, which is different. It's either Fosdyke or Carruthers, depending on which mission you are, you are uh, reading about. So that's pretty sophisticated. Um, and then the next one is random tokens, where um, if, if you've given, uh, given an, a, a token number, it will, which is between 91 and 128, it subtracts 91 to get a number between 0 and 37, fetches the relevant entry from a table called MTIN, and then adds a random number between zero and four to that number and displays that token which you know, is a bit of a mind bender, but this is used for generating that system description. Um, we see for, you know, like this, this system is mildly famous for Lavian, Brandian, you know, vicious art students or whatever it is. This is how it's done, but the randomness is seeded in those cases so that every single system always shows the same thing, but the randomness is still used for some random um, and stuff like that. I'll show you an example in a minute, but if you take an example here, token 104, which uh, would go down to the 13th entry in MTIN, which is 66. So it would print token 66, one, one of them between 66 and 70, which is either juice, brandy, water, brew, or gargle blasters. So they're grouped together in kind of um, uh, subjects. So uh, we'll see another example of that in a minute. But a handy thing about the extended tokens is they can switch back to the standard tokens and back again. So it is very much an extended version on top. So that's how Elite does all of its text. Um, and here are the extended system descriptions I mentioned. Um, so you get the ones that are generated by those seeded random uh, tokens. Um, but then there are some overrides, which are quite interesting, um, for specific systems at specific times in the game. And these are normally used for giving you a hint during a mission. Um, you know, over there, you had, I don't know, anyway, they're all about, you know, finding, tracking down ships and things like that. So an example is, um, Uslery in Galaxy One during the first mission, and the uh, the text of that uh, token is you can tackle the something something if you like. He's at Arara, and the first something is uh, a random token one seventy to one seven four, which is either killer, deadly, evil, lethal, or vicious. Um, and the second one ninety one to ninety five is either son of a bitch, scoundrel, blackguard, rogue, or horse and beetle headed flappy at knave. Um, and if you look at the um, the, that Arara description, actually, no, it's Uslery, you have to be docked. And if you refresh it, it'll cycle through a whole bunch of these randomly um, until you have the evil invective that you, are, you, you prefer. Um, interesting thing is that in the horse and beetle headed flappy at nave one, the headed part is actually head in the disc version and headed in the 6502 second processor version. So I think they thought that the adding edited, headed was better sounding. I suppose horse and beetle head flappy at nave not the best awesome beetle headed flappy and it just rolls off the tongue a bit better so good to see they were improving their invectives 
between versions. And another interesting one is Tiorge in Galaxy One, which is overridden. The, the whole goat soup thing is overridden by the colonists here have violated intergalactic cloning protocol and should be avoided. And that's a reference to the Dark Wheel. Um, Alicia Fields, the character in the Dark Wheel, is from Tiorge and she's a fugitive from um, the, uh, the cloning world. So that's the only example I've found of the book having specific um, content in the game. Apart from obviously the lore is very much in there, but that's specifically about the book. Um, if you go to Aredi in Galaxy 3, and you dock there, you will see a, a slightly sad message, coming soon, Elite 2. Um, and actually it was, wasn't coming soon, it was another nine years. Um, and Anrea in Galaxy 3, if you dock there, you get the message that the inhabitants of Anrea are so amazingly primitive that they still think something is a pretty neat game. And that something is starred out, but I'm pretty sure it's Aviator which is a bit harsh because Aviator is a pretty neat game, so harsh. Um, and then the second processor one that's been changed to are so amazingly primitive that they still think something something is 3D. And it's five letters and then six letters. Not sure what that is. Um, my guess is Cylon Attack because, you know, that sounds about right, but who knows, answers on a postcard. But uh, yeah, some interesting Easter eggs buried in the game there. Right, let's move on to some of the 6502 second processor. Uh, features. Um, just check my timing. Yeah, that was good. Um, so the uh, main difference, as I said, is the four color mode uh, for space. Um, and the, the code is, is similar but different um, in, in, in plotting to this uh, different screen, mainly because in the black and white version, each character row of the screen is, is one page, 256 bytes. And in the color version, it's two pages. So there's an awful lot of code bumping up the high byte if it's on the right hand side of the screen to the left hand side, but essentially it's the same routines uh, underneath this. And the same goes for the eight color mode two dashboard. Um, but the big differences are in, in the striping effects. Um, now the sun is a kind of red yellow stippled effect. Um, it's kind of two pixels tall of each, of each pixel. So it switches columns every, every two rows. Um, and it, it can just about make it out in the top right hand corner of this, of this slide. Um, so that's quite a nice effect. Um, and then there's a, a color called white in the source code, which is actually cyan and red um, column side by side. It's a less effective, it's not very white, but you'll see the planets are like that. Um, and um, the stardust as well. Um, not the explosions, the explosions are orange and stardust. The stuff that goes past you is cyan and red. Um, and also each ship has its own um, color attributes to determine what color it is, is shown when, it, when it's in space and on the scanner. So when you fire a missile, you'll see it's in yellow. Um, Fargoids are white or cyan's cyan red um, and uh, ships cyan generally and junk, things like asteroids are red. So that's how that's done. So there's one extra byte for each ship for this color. Um, I mentioned there's an extra ship in the 6502 second processor version called the Cougar, and it's a rare ship. It's a very rare ship. But how rare is this ship? Um, it's very rare, it turns out. So there's a spawning routine which gets called one out of every 256 main loop iterations. And the main loop iteration, main loop goes round and round, updating the screen uh, and checking all the various bits and bobs and applying tactics. And I covered that in the last talk. So one out of every 256 iterations, it decides, should I spawn a ship? doesn't always spawn a ship, but it thinks about it. So to get a cougar spawning, we have to skip the asteroid spawning uh, routine, which is an 87% chance of, of doing, so that's not too bad. We have to skip the cop spawning routine, which is a 0.4% chance, chance, slightly less. We also have to skip the Fargoid spawning routine, 3.2% chance of that, um, to end up at the cougar spawning routine. So that's a 0.011% chance of spawning a cougar, um, if uh, during the spawning routine, or that's one in 9,000 ship spawnings. And given that it's 6,400 kills to become elite, the Cougar is a rare ship indeed. Um, so you're pretty lucky if you saw that on the, on the second processor version. It's also present in the master version, um, but not in the disc or cassette versions. And it does appear on the scanner in Cyan. Uh, the, I read stuff online about it having a cloaking device and therefore being invisible, but that doesn't appear to be supported in the code in the second processor version. Maybe it's other 8-bit versions, I'm not sure. 
There's a Star Wars demo. I'll, I'll skip through this one quite quickly because it's actually slightly irritating. It kicks in after a certain time on the title screen and you can't escape it, which is just so irritating. Or you can, you know, go be a masochist and press tab to start it off yourself. But the interesting thing about the Star Wars demo, and it's a scroll text that goes up and ships flying around and, and, a, and an elite logo that comes through, is that it uses exactly the same engine as the normal game to display it, including the text. The text is just a collection of lines in the same way that a ship is effectively just a collection of lines. Um, there's an awful lot of them, which you can see when it's moving up, it's actually quite slow, um, even for the, the second processor. But that's because it's using the same exact same projection um, routines as, as in the core game. And the Elite Yogo is stored as a ship, um, type 30, the nose points out of the bottom. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, so, you know, you could actually hack the game quite easily to fight the Elite logo if you fancied. Um, and in this, in this um, demo, the Cobra is, our Cobra is effectively a camera. Um, and they use it to, to if, you know, if you accelerate and, you know, zooms through and past and tilts and stuff, it's quite clever, really. So basically, it's quite a nice simulation box this this demo thing uh, it must be possible to recreate things like the box art using a similar approach so that's something on the to-do list that would be quite interesting because that box art is iconic and um it'd be great to be able to fly around it and, and, and see what happens but um that's interesting stuff now th this is probably the, the the most interesting part of the talk um and it's how the second processor version works with the tube it's um uh you you're going to know loads about the tube experts out there. So let me just run through this um, and I hope I don't get anything wrong. But um, the second processor system, you could buy second processors for your BBC Micro in those wonderful wedge boxes. And I've got one tucked away, um, although I use a Pi now like everybody else and not enough desk, desk space. But uh, wonderful things that plugged in and provided a second processor to sit alongside the system. There's the 6502 uh, second processor, which is the one that Elite runs on, or also Z80. 32016 and of course the famous arm evaluation system which is the second processor um so a really important part of the, of the bbc micro even though they weren't really many that many sold relatively speaking but um uh, it anyway it's it's it's, uh, it's fascinating to work with code that works with this because it, it's such a, a unique system so each computer and you know the the second processor is a computer with its own CPU and memory, they, they work independently alongside each other and they're hooked up via the tube, which is basically just a high-speed interface and a ribbon cable and some software in each end. Um, and uh, in this relationship, the BBC Micro is known as the IO processor, or sometimes the host, but I've stuck with IO processor. And the IO processor deals with IO, input output. So that's the display, the keyboard, sound, reading the joystick, accessing the disk, all that sort of stuff. On the second processor, which is known as the parasite, slightly unfortunate, I don't really like that term much, but it's the term. Um, it's uh, um, the brains of the operation. So it's got, it's faster CPU in there. It's got 64K of RAM. So that's where Elite is running when you're running second processor Elite. Um, and the, the, the BBC Micro is just um, doing dealing with input and output or, well, in a traditional tube setup, that's all it's doing. The BBC Micro is doing a bit more than that in Elite. It's, it's not quite as dumb as, as uh, uh, that, those names would make out. But Elite is a bit of a poster child for the whole second processor system because the amount of communication required over the tube is relatively small. Elite is a, a vector graphics game. And so the, the ships, sophisticated though they are, are described by just line coordinates. And that's really quite a compact data structure for something so sophisticated. It wouldn't, this setup wouldn't work for a bitmap system so much. Um, but if you can describe what you want to appear on screen succinctly and instruct your IO processor, you have something that's very suitable for the tube. And Elite is probably, uh, one, of, it's probably one of the most suited programs out there. So let's have a look at how this actually works. You've got, you've got your um, Parasite and your IO processor, what's going on? Now for quite a few operations, Elite just uses the operating system and doesn't have to think about anything. So file saving and loading, for example, it just calls OzFile and off we go. Uh, the, the tube software worries about talking across the tube. It's all completely invisible to us and you know, we get the file we want loaded back. So that, that, that's used for a few, but obviously we need a much more sophisticated setup if we're gonna make the most 
of this two processor system. So for the bulk of the communication, um, Elite uses two custom APIs. Now I'm using the word API here because that's what we'd call it these days. Um, APIs are quite a new concept, but actually are talking between two systems, separate system, that's an API. So I'll use that terminology because um, that works for modern thinkers. So we have two APIs and I'll go, I'll go through these in, in detail. And I should say, I don't really know how to pronounce the, the first one here because I've only read it in books. It's the Oz operating system right character um, routine. Osruch is what I say in my head. So I'm going to say Osruch. But if you say it differently, let me know because I learned in one of the ACORN talks that they called it ADFS, not ADFS. And I'm, it just sounded completely bizarre. So who knows how these are pronounced, but Osruch in this talk. Osruch is used for a single byte, one way command. And it makes the most of parallelism, which I'll go into in a minute. And then Osword is used for parameter block two-way commands between the two, but it has blocking, um, which I'll also explain later. But the way that this works is that the IO process, so the BBC Micro, after setting up these APIs, stops doing anything, just finishes the program, it terminates and sits there idle. I mean, idle in the sense of, you know, it's a computer, it's always doing something, but it does not running any, any elite code at that point. Meanwhile, the parasite in the second processor starts running all of the main elite game code and it issues commands to the IO processor over these APIs and instructs the IO processor to do certain things, which the IO processor then does and sometimes returns information. So that's how it works. So let's have a look at these APIs because they're, they're the core. Um, how are we doing for time? Okay. Um, so uh, let's look at the Osrich API. Uh, first of all, this is the one byte one. Uh, the way these work is on the parasite, on the BBC Micro, we simply intercept the, the vector for this call, rich V. <laughs> this can't be right. Um, the right character vector, we intercept that with our own custom uh, handler. And so Osrich commands 128147, um, th those are the ones that are used by Elite. And those are the commands that are sent by the parasite to the IO processor. And they go through this handler um, and that's where we implement our API commands. Now, each time uh, a command is sent, we have to send two bytes. So that's two Osrich commands from the IO processor. Um, and we send them just by calling JSR Osrich in the, in the, IO, uh, in the parasite rather. Uh, so and that sends a command. We have to send two commands. One is the command number and one is an argument. Now, not all of the commands take an argument, but we still have to pass two bytes. It always passes the same one again, just because it's quick. Um, but the whole system is built on two bytes. And that's because when the IO processor receives a command on, on this API, it switches the right char character oh, vector, Rutschver, gets pointed to the specific routine for that command. And then, so that then consumes the next bytes byte or bytes until it's finished and then it puts the, the vector back to the, the one that handles the, the command number. So that, that means that we can keep, let me give you an example. Um, actually, I'll give you an example in the next page, but it means we can have multi-byte Osrich commands that we just have to keep sending the bytes. Um, so and an interesting, uh, very relevant thing is Osrich is parallel. So as soon as the uh, parasite has issued an Osrich command to the IO processor, it goes off and keeps doing stuff, right? And the IO processor does whatever it needs to do. And they run in parallel for a little bit here. So Osrich commands are efficient. Um, that's not the case with the Osword commands, just the Osrich ones. So it gains us a bit of parallelism. It's not quite multi-core processing because they still don't talk to each other. There's no timing between them. It's just that they go off and do their stuff. Um, some examples will make this clearer. So begin lin is a, a, an Osrich command. Um, this one, uh, the begin lin command tells the uh, IO processor, right, I'm going to send you a whole bunch of line coordinates. And the argument of begin lin is the number of bytes in that set of lines, each line being four coordinates, um, four bytes rather. Um, X and Y for the start of the line, X and Y for the end of the line. Um, so once we've sent a begin lin, that switches the IO processor into waiting for N um, bytes of line data. And then we send an add byte command with each time, bang, bang, bang. And when we've sent the right number, the IO processor knows 
right, I've got them all, let's go and draw them. And remember, this is parallel. So the last, well, as soon as the uh, paras parasite has sent the last line by, the BBC Micro goes off and starts doing all the complex, time-consuming drawing while the parasite can go off and do whatever it's doing next, which is probably working out uh, what the next ship should look like. So that's an example of how we can send bulk bytes in, in terms of, you know, one after the other. Another one is um, read params, which is for the dashboard update. And this sends 15 values, one for each of the, the dials and um, uh, indicators on the, on the dashboard. Um, and then when that, the last one is sent in, again, the BBC Micro goes off and updates the dashboard. You have set XC and set YC to set the X and Y of the text cursor. Do dials hide the dashboard for when we die. It's any time that the dashboard hide, uh, disappears. Um, set VDU19 can change the mode one palette. There's actually four palettes applied to the top screen, depending on whether we're in space or trading or in a chart, that sort of thing. So this switches between them. You've got do call, which sets the current color which allows us to change the color of text and so on as we're, as we're uh, writing to the screen. Uh, do VIE uh, uh, sets the 6522IER um, to control interrupts, which is almost always used for the keyboard to you know, disable or enable the keyboard. And finally, printer and prilf writes to the printer or do a line feed on the printer. So again, that's obviously a very IO processory type of thing. So there are other um, Osrich uh, uh, APIs in their API calls, but uh, you can see them on the website. So that's Osrich. And the other one is Osword. And Osword, again, it intercepts word V. And the good thing about this one is I can pronounce this one. Um, intercepts word V on the parasite in the same way. Um, and uh, this time it's Osword commands 240 to 49, and they get passed through a jump table. So literally, there's none of this handing off word V to the, to the routine. They just literally go through a vector into a jump table um, uh, and off to the relevant routine. And that parameter block, um, the first byte uh, of that is the number of bytes we're going to transmit as part of the, uh, um, uh, the basically the size of the block, transmit to the I/O processor, and then the second number is the number of bytes we want back. So this is about sending a block of bytes and receiving a block of bytes. So it's quite different to Ozbyte, which is just shouting orders at the I/O process. So this is much more of an involved conversation, if you like, about you know passing data backwards and forwards. And the operating system takes care of the actual transmitting and receiving. So we don't have to worry about that. We just know that the, the data that's sent will live at a certain address that, that gets sent and we get it in the in the um, uh, in a certain I think it's in X and Y actually I can't remember now and that gets labels just a point at um, at the block that's received. So um, this is like a, a kind of it's a block-based uh, Osrich, if you like, um, but it doesn't have any parallelism. So when the parasite sends an Osword API call, it waits for the response. So it gets blocked. So um, I guess that they, they, they had to decide which one to use. I have to say there's some, there's some in the Osword API that you'd think would be better in the, uh, the non-blocking Osrich um, API, but um, anyway, they, they built it, they know. So anyway, the, uh, here are some Osword API examples. There's the keyboard. And, and do, take, do DKS4, lovely title there, which scan the keyboard either for anything that's being pressed or for specific keys. Obviously, a, um, a classic IO processor thing, and they, where they wait for the response. Pixel plots a space dust pixel. I don't know why that one's in this one. Um, MS bar updates the missile indicators. Um, w scan waits for the vertical sync. Obviously, that's a good one for using blocking technology because you want to wait. Um, SC48 draws a ship on the scanner. Um, some of these do have quite large blocks of data, so perhaps that's why they're, they're done as Oswood. But like dot drawing a dot on the compass is actually a fairly small amount of data. H loin draws the horizontal sun lines with the stippling. Hanger draws the ship hanger that we see when we dock. Um, and some prot is part of the uh, copy protection. So when the game is starting up, um, the uh, uh, parasite issues a sum prot command early on, and the IO processor sends back a routine in this block of memory that, that is run on the, uh, on the uh, parasite as part of the copy protection. So that's quite a sneaky one, took a little while to work out. Now, finally, final slide um, is the mystery of Tina. Uh, this is interesting. So just before the IO processor code terminates and starts its listening for any API calls, the last thing it does before handing over to the, the uh, uh, API handlers is it checks page B for the characters 
T-I-N-A at the start in capitals. And if they're present, it calls the location after the A with the JSR. So this means that you can add a hook into second processor elite by filling page B with code, Tina at the start and then code, and it will get called during startup of this game. It's a bit of a mystery what this is for, but um, I suspect um, it's to do with Music 500 because Chris Jordan, who uh, was at Aconsoft for this a whole period and um, went on to form Hybrid, um, he told me that the uh, 6502 second processor edition contains a software interface to a Music 500 sound driver. It doesn't actually contain a driver, just a software interface to a driver added by Ian Bell, who was a Music 500 owner. Uh, to upgrade the game sound and music. So I wonder if this is it. This is where you could add a driver if you wanted to. But of course, you could add a driver for anything. It would be something that, you know, set up on the I.O. processor um, and uh, would do what you like. So who knows? Mystery of Tina. I don't know. Who knows what that is? Um, and because I couldn't find anywhere else to put it in, but it's sort of an interesting fact. There are some labels in the 6502 second processor original source that are interesting. There's black suspenders, thongs and whips. I have no idea whether they're anything to do with Tina, but um, it's an interesting human aspect to the source. That's it. So just quick uh, future plans for this project. I'm going to add some more deep dives on, on the site. Uh, the next big task is to create a version comparison tool so that you can compare the different versions at the instruction level to see what, what is different between them. And that would also cover different releases of the same version. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I'd quite like to look at the BBC Master version, the graphics routines, because they're quite a lot smoother. And there's also the Electron version. And I mean, there are other 6502 versions out there. So who knows? Um, if you're interested in everything in this talk and everything in the previous talk, bbcelite.com is the URL. Um, there's loads of stuff on there. And, and there's links to the Git repositories where you can build your own versions of Elite from the source. Um, and that's the end of the talk. So um, I guess we can move on to questions. Okay, Th uh, thank you very much, Mark. Um, yeah, w once again, that was a, um, a very um, thorough, very uh, very well presented uh, talk. That was very clear. Thank you, Mark. Um, so let's see if we uh, for questions. Um, let's they're coming in thick and fast now. <laughs> let's see if I can keep up. <laughs> um, a, a very general question uh, to begin with, uh, which, which is, uh, how on earth did Mark get all this detailed information? <laughs> <laughs> I uh, think... That's a good question. Um, um, well, uh, uh, by reading the source, to be honest, that's the source, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, 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 it's, the, the source is available um, and the cassette version of there are there are various uh, i'm not you know I, i've been standing on the shoulders of giants in this project for sure um and um uh there's a big shout out to um kieran connell uh his star dot hero bit shifters collective yep. who created a bbasm version of the source from ian bell's site which then i could take and build and once you as a software engineer if you know if you can build something you can understand it in theory so that was a big step there's also paul brinks uh, annotated assembly which is available on, on the web which loads of clues really it's a bit terse and it's a bit hard to understand if you just sit down and try and read it but once you've sort of started getting your head around things that was a really useful document uh, the actual source itself is pretty terse so there wasn't a lot in there but there are quite a few there's obviously a lot of stuff out there on the web on certain aspects things like the procedural generation is quite well documented already um and um uh, there's lots of chat on Stardots, a great, uh, uh, you know, great source of information on things like how the tube works and, and how what people think Elite is doing and stuff. And it's, a, it's an interesting topic for people. So there's a lot out there. So research uh, on, on the web and putting it all in a big pot and then having lockdown really lots of time. You know, I'm, an, I'm a journalist from the past, an Acorn journalist. So I like talking, I like writing and I'm a coder. So it's a really good um, combination. So that's how the I mean, I only started it to try to work out how the split screen part worked, because that's the bit that interested me. And then it kind of snowballed after that. And I thought, well, go on, let's do the rest of it. And so um, this is a kind of logical progression from the cassette version. There's an awful lot of overlap. But it's because I, I loved the game when I was 
a kid. I mean, look up here, right? That's the, the ship identification chart from Elite is on my wall. And that's my Elite Dangerous VR rig. You know, I like this stuff. And so it's fascinating to look at this world and, and almost like, you know, Wizard of Oz sort of pulled back the curtain. And the great thing is that in working out how it worked, it actually made it more interesting, didn't spoil the magic. It, it, it revealed astonishing uh, achievement. I mean, it really is a, it's a privilege yeah. to work with this code, it really is. So uh, how did I have, how did I manage it? Well, I had time uh, <laughs> and lots of research. <laughs> okay, and um, other questions coming in. Um, someone asked, uh, did, did I understand this correctly? Uh, is the mission control uh, token based? Mission control. Yeah, I'm, I'm not too clear on on, on that myself. Um, I guess so, the, if by mission the, control, the, yeah, like, mission, uh, quick, you know, quickly explain how the missions work. Missions work whenever you dock. There is a routine that is called that checks your mission status. Have you started a mission? Have you not? And the way it works out whether you should start a mission. There's certain rules around it. Are you in the right galaxy? Um, are you of a certain rank? Um, and then it'll pop up the, the mission um, uh, briefings. But it's all just done in a separate JS, a uh, separate subroutine that's JSR'd every time you dock. Has some flags in there, there's four, four bits of flags, two for the first uh, mission, two for the second that, that retain your st uh, where you are in the mission. Um, and that triggers various things, but the tokens store the text that is shown. So the tokenization system is, you know, those, those long, I mean, I remember when it first, first happened to me on the disc elite, it was just so exciting as a 14 year old to see these <gasps> missions, you know, this is amazing, I'm in the Space Navy. Um, and had that, you know, rotating constrictor on screen that then slowly goes away from the screen and this message comes from whatever, which one is it, Carruthers or Fosdike, I can't remember now, about, you know, you, we've lost this ship, can you help us, fantastic. All that text, that's stored in the, in the extended token system. And so are the hints that get overridden when you dock at a system and it says you can find the blaggard at Arara, those are tokenized, but there's a separate mission routine that's not very complicated. It literally is looking and saying, is this bit set? And are you at this rank? If so, right, go on, let's start mission one. Yeah. So it's quite easy. You could see it, you see that being quite easy to extend should you want to do that. But um, yeah, that's quite, it's not very sophisticated. It doesn't need to be. Um, so that's how the mission system works. Don't know if that's answered okay, the question. I think, I think it has, yes. Um, it, um, so Andrew said, "Yep, yeah, okay, he gets it." <laughs> and uh, a, a question uh, from uh, Stuart, which is, um, "Does Mark have any sense of if the cassette version is a cut-down disc version, or the disc version is an elaborated cassette version?" Yeah, the disc version is definitely a, a, an extended uh, cassette version. So the cassette version is clearly the first one that was built, um, and there are some documents on uh, in Bell's website that that sort of go along with this there's a the letter that he's published from uh it's actually the the manual that, that they wrote to hand to Aiken soft for them to turn into the glossy beautiful uh manual that we all know and love um and at the bottom of that they talk about features they'd quite like to think about adding to an extended version but the description before that is all the core game so i'm pretty sure that the, the cassette version was the one that was written and then they thought, but we want to add this and add that. And um, it's not hard to do because they're obviously just, you know, if you've got extra memory, they're extra subroutines that you just put a hook into and, and add. And you can kind of see that all the all the extra stuff is is kind of additional. A good example is that newbie, new byte, literally called new byte. You know, right, we need yeah, a new yeah. byte for the advanced tactics in the disc version. What we're going to do, right, and slap it on the end. So there's, it, you can see that the cassette stuff is the core and, and it is additive. Um, and it's, it's similar with the, the 6502 second processor one um, in that, you know, the, the demo is obviously bolted on um, and, uh, but it's a bit, I suppose, uh, really that's more of a refactoring into two different uh, machines than, than a massive rewrite. But there is a lot of overlap in the code. I mean, the library um, project I have, which I, I do aim to release at some point, but it, it has, um, e each routine has one file and it has if statements about what version is this. So you can literally see what the differences are. So that the next project is try to expose that on the website. But some are a complete rewrite. The, the graphics ones can be a bit, you know, nah, it's just, you know, that's not really much of an overlap just because of the, the functioning of the, of the, the, you know, the color screens versus black and white. But generally they are quite subtle differences uh, between the versions. 
So they are, although there are lots of differences, they aren't that fundamental. So yeah, definitely, I can see the progression from cassette right. to disc to um, the tube version. Right, and and another question here. Um, Kevin Edwards um, asks, uh, where was the speed bottleneck when running Tube Elite? Was it the parasite or the host? Well, um, I don't know. I haven't analysed um, which one slows it down, but it, I suspect um, it's the, the I.O. processor because it still has to do quite a lot of mucking around to, to write to the screen. Those, those screenwriting um, routines are fairly sophisticated. Um, but I don't know. That is a good question. But the fact that it runs really quickly probably indicates, and it doesn't slow down when you have a lot, you've got a lot more ships available on screen and it doesn't slow down at all that I've noticed. And um, I think if it was then most of the hard extra work there really is, is doing all the uh, rotating the universe and applying the vector math. So I suspect that the tube side is coping pretty well um, and uh, that the BBC side would be the bottleneck, but it doesn't really slow down much, I don't find. So I'm not sure it is bottlenecked that much, really. Um, I think they did a pretty good job, but um, that needs more investigation. That's probably getting a bit hair. I'm good at writing documentation for code, but actually hooking into that and working out stuff like that, that's probably probably more, yeah, more your area, Kevin, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, and... Um... Mike uh, asks, um, have you played the uh, new version, Elite Dangerous? And yeah, Earth? absolutely. I'm triple elite. Love it. And have you played Mad it in VR? Um, yeah, VR. I adore it. Um, it's, uh, it's a great game. And it's a great game because I think that they've um, built it on the core of the original Elite, not Elite 2. I didn't really get along with Elite 2 with its, you know, uh, proper Newtonian physics. I'm a bit more of a flying a spaceship <laughs> as a kid type guy. Um, and I loved it because it is, it is the same. It's, it really feels like the same game with Bells and Now it obviously has the same problems in that it's open world and all that, but um, it, you know, it, it, it pops up on, uh, on, on, on game stores for very little money and it was free on the Epic store before Christmas. Oh, it's worth it for that. It's a fantastic game. I love it. Um, but it's not for everyone. But yeah, great game. But VR, wow. I mean, come on. Like I was a 14-year-old boy, right? Falling in love with yeah. Elite back on the Beeb. And it's still atmospheric on the Beeb. I, I keep looking over here because that's where my BBC is, <laughs> next to the main computer. Um, you know, that that was a real... I mean, I fire it up and it's still got the suns and, the you know, the atmosphere and the ships. It's brilliant. But VR, I mean, that's... If I, if I could have told my 14-year-old self, yeah, you'd have that in your, in your study. Come on. <laughs> Doesn't get better than that, does it? I am still married, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think the, the last question in, in the uh, in the chat window is: um, Has Mark met Ian Bell and David Braben? Braben? I haven't. No, I haven't. I have been in touch with Ian Bell, um, who said that was outrageously comprehensive, which is a lovely thing, and, and told me a few things about it. So he sort of gave it a, a thumbs up from a distance. I haven't met David Braben. Um, that would be rather cool. Um, but you know, should you meet your heroes? I mean, I've just been enjoying reading their source code. To be honest, that's that's a pretty good way of doing it. I think <laughs> it says a lot about them. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure how, how we're doing for, for time at this point. Um, I, I think we generally open to the floor, as in people can share out uh, questions possibly at this point. Um, what whilst that, that's happening, um, I, I shall take. Oh, we've got a question that's come in. Uh, so I'll ask that in a sec. Um, ask, uh, I'll be rude um, and ask one of my own, which is um, with the uh, disc version, um, what does, how does the memory uh, layout uh, of the code, you know, uh, differ greatly to handle overlays fr from uh, disc access to um. compare to the cassette version? Yeah, it's it's essentially all different versions of Elite are made up of a similar set of routines, all in different orders. Um, in that they, uh, with with the disc version, uh, um, it, it swaps in and out the uh, memory between eleven E three and um, five. 
it's 6,000 basically as a starter screen memory. So the whole the whole bit between the start of the code, it has a little bit of code before that because page is effectively 11, 1,100 on, on the disk version. So the first E3 bytes, I can't convert that to decimal in my head, those stay the same and those contain uh, various, uh, like the, the commander save file, various things like that, that that are retained. And then there's loads of variables in zero page, the text tokens live in, uh, page four, five, and six, I think, and there's something, there's a few things dotted around that stay there, but it swaps out the code, which is the T code and D code things between 11E3 and the beginning of uh, screen memory. So it's pretty tight. Uh, the trade code, the dot code, has its own ship blueprints loaded as part of it that are shown in the, in the ship hangar. So that's a small subset of ships that are shown there. So they really have bumped it up to screen memory, which starts at 6,000, and then that goes to 7F00, and then there are, and then there's the missile blueprint that lives there, and then 8,000, of course, is ROM. So it's, it's not as jam-packed as the cassette one. The cassette one is really rammed. There's hardly any free bytes, and I talked about that in the last talk. Uh, there's a bit more free space in, in the disk version, but it's not a lot, actually. There's not, you know, they really have... Um, the thing is, there's a lot of repetition between the two. All the maths routines are required in both. Um, so... You know, because when you're docked, you're still, you're still drawing circles in the chart and stuff like that, and you're still drawing ships in the mission briefings. So a lot of the code is the same. It's in a slightly different order. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that's... that's um, and there are subtle differences, obviously. You don't need all of the code in both. Um, there's quite a lot of stuff that, you know, things like you don't, you don't have the code for drawing laser lines when you're docked, obviously. So things like that are, are dropped just to save some memory. But they are pretty full. And it is a swap in and out of, of, of you know, the chunk of code in the middle. Um, yeah, it's quite well structured. Okay. Uh, and so as I asked that question, a, a couple more flew in. So um, I'll take the opportunity to ask those. So um, uh, David asks, any plans for a book version of bbcelite.com? <laughs> no, that wouldn't be legal, I don't think. I mean, you've got really? to remember, this isn't my source code. Uh, it's yeah. my waffle around it, but the source code is copyright Acornsoft, 1984 or 1985, and I am not Acornsoft. So that um, would be down to rights and so on, and that is uh, a, a different area. The source code has been released by the authors, or by, by Ian Bell on his website, so it is out there, but that doesn't mean you can stick it in a book. Right. And... <laughs> it's funny and, and someone's oh you should write a book I think someone says <laughs> but you just answered that one and another question comes in can you describe the process for recreating all of the elite box screenshots how did he go about creating the copro and executive edition screenshots so the the uh, basically the the original cassette one I took a scans from, I've got, you know, I've got elite. So I scanned that there's various photos and there's, there's, it's not digital. It's off the back of the box. So I took all of the versions I could get scans from magazines and basically built it pixel by pixel by hand. Um, you know, by putting that as a back backdrop in, in GIMP I used and then filled in the dots. Um, so that one was completely manual. And uh, then the, uh, Copro and um, uh, well, the, the executive and Copro ones are, are the same but coloured in. Uh, so really, I worked out the colour scheme, and I got, didn't get it right first time round. So there's been a few iterations of that because of the you know the EO logic in the scanner and stuff is slightly subtle, um, and it's possibly not exactly right in terms of the stippling effect in the explosion and. <laughs> and uh, because I've only looked at that code recently and thought, that's probably not what I did, but hey, it's good enough. Um, but yeah, it's all done manually, but it's basically the same shot, but coloured. Um, so uh, that's how that, and the Electron one I did by hand again, because that's a completely different bunch of ships in different places. So it's very manual, no process involved, um, just good old fashioned filling in pixels that look right, and flipping, <laughs> flipping between the two versions and going, is that a pixel there? Click. Um, and I did, I did, it, did it as part of a project for, um, uh, for I'm sure he won't mind me saying, for, for Dave Arcadian um, to recreate all of the screenshots for every, all the box screenshots for every Acorn Soft game on the BBC Electron Atom, which uh, 
we've recently been released as a, an amazing poster of all of them and they're all done manually by you know some of them would i could grab from i mean some of this actually yeah okay so elite the dashboard i grabbed it while playing the game good point yeah so some of it obviously you know you just fire it up an emulator export the image and then fill it in so that the dashboard is, is is bang on but all the stuff in the space view i had to uh had to do manually as i did with most of the screenshots for you know snapper and the like just play it enough times and do enough screenshots to get all the different monsters in the right places and then move them around and make sure it's exact so that was the whole range and this was just one of them so actually a question i think it's from uh dave himself have you got the poster to hand is it on the wall can we see it uh no you can't <laughs> <laughs> hold up there it's going behind this door <laughs> Right. <laughs> Have I got a big to-do list of things that aren't elite? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think I'm up to date on all the questions from the chat window. Um. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, uh, uh, there's always more to say. Um. I haven't covered everything. Obviously, it's a sophisticated game, and um, I think that the next code bit I've been interested in is the master because the master is a lot more it's a lot smoother the graphics and there's some debate about how that's done I think we all probably know how it's done now having chatted about it in Stardot but it'd be good to actually track down those routines and document that properly so that's that's something that could be interesting um, you know there's always more that can be said I haven't really covered the ship tactics and how they work that's a pretty gnarly area so yeah there could be a part three but um you know let's see how the lockdowns go hopefully we're going to be running out of them soon <laughs> so there won't be a reason for doing this but um the idea is to uh yeah i've got more i want to add to the site so there's always more to say it's kind of a, a, a bottomless pit of interesting stuff this this game a random a random thought occurs well probably not that random but um on on all this stuff obviously you've you've um so it's been very much um, pouring over and, and documenting in, in uh, amazing detail how it all uh, works and, and fits together. Um, have you had any thoughts um, to um, do any sort of uh, changes, um, enhancements, additions, uh, just dabbling in that area or? Yeah, I mean, so I think it would be quite nice to create. I'm not that keen on the 6502 second processor look, right? It's a bit garish. I prefer, for me, space is black and white, right? That's how it is. So the thought of creating a version that, or whichever platform it runs on, because you can pick and choose these days, that is black and white like the disk version, uh, fast like the 6502 version, but without all the crazy extra ships. So a kind of mishmash of the best ofs with the master's flicker, far less flickery graphics routines. So in a way, in a sense, picking the best ofs from the different versions, that, that's slightly appealing. Yeah, I think that would that would probably be worth doing. And I, I, another one that someone someone mentioned, suggested on Starlock forums, which sounds great, is to try to, uh, I mentioned it in the, in the talk, try to set up the box art in game using the approach that the demo uses. So you'd have to hack a few things there because ships can't have zero speed as it is, but um, they could do if you change that code, it wouldn't be very hard. So the thought of setting up all those ships in kind of exactly the right right place and then being able to kind of fly a camera through them, that sounds quite interesting, but um, we'll see, we'll see. I think first of all, though, I'd like to do this uh, comparison part so that we can you know, literally compare the different versions and see what's, what's changed because that's quite interesting people as well so anyway lots of things on the to-do list it's you know it's too long really so <laughs> it's not over yet watch this space okay all right um i'm get, I, oh and looks like dave has just put up the uh poster of, of your handiwork there mm. we can't hear you if, if, if you're talking uh, uh dave well, I wasn't talking. No. Okay. The thing is, Mark's not got room to display it, and mine's in a big flat sleeve as well, not on the wall. <laughs> these don't look quite right because these were done for print, so they're, they're CMYK colour schemes. You know, you have to adjust the colours when you're preparing print-ready artwork. So the reds look a bit off. The greens don't look like BBC green. And Mark must have sent about three or four revisions every month or two. He'll send me another version because he's noticed a star was like one pixel out of alignment or something. But talk about attention to detail. 
this is the tube version. Nobody thinks these screenshots are actually possible. They think they were mock-ups, don't they? Because you'd never get... Yeah, it was this, alluded this, to yeah. an Acorn user that they were mock-ups. So I yeah. think they were, they were certainly not while playing the game. You know, if they, if, if they set them up, I don't know. No idea how they did them, but yes, they're mock-ups. Um, but yes. And there we go. There's the two, um, the two snappers. The withdrawn snapper and the legal snapper. Yeah, it was good. I had to learn to play all the games enough to <laughs> grab all the relevant bits, um, which was not too bad on the, on the BBC ones. A bit more challenging on the Atom. <laughs> anyway, I'll just reiterate my thanks anyway to, to, to Mark for doing that, that great presentation um, and just all, all the work you've done there for... for, for um, the inner workings of Elite. I've spent a lot of time pouring through your website and also just um, a quick personal comment on, on the layer of the site. It's great. It's how the, it's how the web used to look in, in simpler times as in it, it's yeah. instant. It's not, it's not surrounded by um, just su superfluous junk everywhere. It's very, very readable, very, very quick to render. And of course, very well described. So thank you very much for that, Matt. Uh, good. Yes. I'm glad you said that because it's my own, my own protest against the crud that I have to deal with as a professional in the web world. So this is, there's no, no fluff. <laughs> exactly. Um, that, great work. Thank you so much. You. All right. Uh, so th thank you, Mark. Yay! Yay! <laughs> awesome. Thank you. <laughs> was, was that 20 seconds? No, it's only 19. We'll have to start again. <laughs> no. oh, I am leaving. <laughs> <laughs>